everybody. Welcome to Remnant. How are we doing? Fantastic. My name is Frank. I'm one of the pastors. I'm so glad you're here. It's a good day to be in God's house. Hey, we've, we've been in this series, and uh, i got a lot to talk about because I always have a lot to talk about. Um, but I want people to understand sort of what this series is about, so catch up those that are new. If you're new to Remnant, I'm so glad you're here. Um, we're just a group of people who are trying to learn more about Jesus so we can surrender more, so we can be transformed more, so we can get out of the way and let God do what he wants to do in our lives. And so we come here every week to accomplish that. And we've been in this series, and it's really about Gnosticism, or at least the early church's attempt to stop a movement in the church that threatened the truth of what the apostles knew to be true about Jesus. We're in 2 Peter, and 2 Peter is Peter's death row letter to the church. He's about to die. He's basically telling the church, here's what you need to know. Above all else, I've learned everything. Here's what you need to know. There was a move that would eventually be called Gnosticism. What Gnosticism taught was you're not saved because of Jesus or because of your sins or forgiveness or his death or resurrection because that never actually happened. What they taught was you're saved by special knowledge, that a certain group of people find an enlightened special knowledge, and through that, they become the, uh, those who get saved. And so what they would say is there's, Jesus never really was human. Jesus never really died on the cross. He never really resurrected because you never really needed to worry about your sins because what salvation is based on is not what you do or how you act, but it's based on the fact that you have special knowledge. And we've talked about how every false religion we know today is based on having special knowledge and discounting what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So Peter is writing to the church saying, look, these false teachers are coming. You better get ready because I won't be here anymore to argue for you. He's identified himself. He says, I'm Simon and I'm Peter. Uh, he says, I was a slave and I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's identified his audience, mostly Gentiles, non-Jewish people who have received the same faith, the same promise, the same potential of glory that he has received. And we've talked about all that during the last couple of weeks, so you can always catch up going back online. All of our sermons are online. The sermon notes are online. If you can't fall asleep one night, just put on a sermon. It'll be great. It works really well. He's told us there's a lifeline that we have to hold on to. In other words, we got to hold on to Jesus with every ounce of every fiber we have if we want to be pulled out of the corruption that is in this world. He's reminded us that the foundation of the church that God is building is Jesus Christ, who's the cornerstone, that the 12 apostles represent the foundation of that church, they guard the truth, and that each of us are living stones, living out our lives in Christ, making up the church of Jesus Christ. Now, in this letter, we're only in about the fifth verse, and he's already begun to challenge any concept of new or special knowledge. He says, look, one truth from God has been delivered by the apostles to the church. There's nothing new to add to it. There's nothing you can add to it. There's no other religion that you can follow. The disciples delivered the truth once and for all, and your job as, as followers of Christ is to guard, protect and allow God to reveal himself perfectly through you. Peter says, we've all had the same gift. The same salvation gift I received, Peter says, is the same one that you receive. He offers to everyone who believes in their heart and in their head that Jesus took their place on the cross, that he paid for their sins, that he resurrected, that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. And just as the church is based on that truth, you and I are built spiritually on the foundation of our faith. No one can take that from us, but Peter would tell us, look, the gospel message is great. The gift you've been given is great, but that's the beginning of your walk with Christ, not the end. In other words, when you come up out of the waters of baptism, you're starting the race, not ending it. Second Peter verse one, or chapter 1, verse 4. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, that's where we left off last week, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue, wow, that's pubescent. Um, 
And virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Note Peter's words here really carefully. Whenever you see a series like this, one leading to the next, leading to the next, leading to the next, he is giving you a spiritual pathway. He is giving you steps or, or phases that have to happen. You've been pulled out of your sin, he said. Remember last week we talked about holding on to that lifeline from the helicopter. You've been pulled out of that canyon of death. You're holding on to Jesus with everything you have. You've been rescued from the mess and punishment your sins caused. And now you have to ask yourself a question. Why did God rescue me? Really, we have to think about that. Why did God rescue me? You see, because if all God wanted was for you to go to heaven, the fastest way to do that is just let you out in the canyon. Hmm. You see, you and I could have confessed Jesus as Lord when we were unable to be rescued, just like the guy on the cross next to Jesus. And that night we could be in eternity with Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves a question, why? Did God rescue us? Why not just call us home? I mean, truly, if, if accepting Christ is the end of our walk, then he can just call us home as soon as we come out of the baptismal waters. But the reality is, is we weren't saved just for us. God not only saves us from our sins, God not only guarantees our eternal salvation, not only recreates in us a new spiritual being, he does that and he does all of that and then he leaves us on earth maybe for decades. Why? Why not just get a deathbed confession and acceptance of Jesus and go straight home? Well, the answer is simple. If your heart's still beating, God has work for you to do here. God chose to reach the world with the message of salvation through us. We exist to know him and to share that truth with other people. That's why we're here. That's the only reason we're here. We're not here to experience bliss and happiness. We're not here to build up things for ourselves. The teachings of Jesus are very clear. You are here for one purpose, to know God and to reflect him to other people who don't, and to help each other become better mirrors of him. To really know him, know about him, know him emotionally, know him spiritually, to have experience with him, to have experienced him, know him in every sense of the word, he is our everything. And God, for some reason, chose to reveal to the lost Jesus through us. That's why we're here. Don't ever forget why you still have a heartbeat. You have a heartbeat because somebody, God knows, you can help reach with the message. Amen. I honestly believe that the moment that I stop reaching all the people God wanted me to reach, he'll call me home. And he'll do the same for you. Think about what a horrible waste of potential it would be for God to rescue you from your mess and then let you just hang out on earth serving yourself until it's time to go home. That's exactly what the Gnostics are going to teach. You were never saved because there's no such thing as sin. Your spirit is not impacted by anything you do physically on earth because physical things are bad, spiritual things are good. That's why Jesus could never have been a human, they say. You're saved by having special knowledge. Once you have the special knowledge, you can do whatever you want. There is no sin. There is no problem. You don't need forgiveness because you have anything wrong. Those, those are echoing in almost every New Age false religion in our culture today. This has not changed in 2,000 years. So we have to go very slowly here as Peter makes a transition. You have perfect standing with God because of your faith in Jesus Christ. Your foundation is rock, pun intended, solid. You have your salvation based on your faith and your faith alone. You don't earn it. You can't earn any burn brownie points. You, you have it based on faith. For that reason, God saved you. And Peter says, make every effort, every 
effort. The Greek here is that of a striving athlete given their last ounce that they have to get across the finish line. Make every effort to do what? Hmm. Let me go back. Peter, chapter 1, verse 4. Let's read it again. Having escaped from the corruption, for this reason make every effort to supplement your faith. Wait a minute, you mean I just don't get to sit around and just relax now that I'm saved? No. You're to strive like an Olympic athlete in the last ounce of their being. You're, you're striving to supplement your faith. To take the foundation of your faith and build your life on it. Make every effort. You're not to sit in comfort in your salvation and soak in the rays of God's love. That is a part of our relationship with him. But when you come up out of the water, the race of your life begins and the gun goes off. It's now time to begin to live out your life like a trained athlete, Peter says. Or if you like it better, Simon says. (laughs) Do you realize what that means? Peter, like James, is trying to wake up the frozen chosen. He's trying to get you to understand that you aren't here on earth just to attend church. You're here on earth to reflect everything about Jesus to other people. One thing Peter knows very well is how to take action based on his faith. He's the disciple that rushed in before his brain took over. He did it over and over and over. He knows about impulsive acts of faith. But Peter says, look, you weren't pulled out of that canyon to serve yourself you got to make every effort to supplement your faith. Now, that doesn't mean you're supposed to change yourself. Because you can't. If you could, you wouldn't have been in that canyon in the first place. What he's saying is, look, you need to outline and to be available to allow the Holy Spirit to do everything he wants to do in your life. you got to get out of the way and let God grow through you so he can show himself through you. You don't do it, you surrender. You don't try to make yourself a better person. You abide stronger in Jesus and you become a better person. When Peter speaks of striving, what he says is you and I need to put ourselves in the best possible place we can to learn everything that the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. We're not making ourselves more mature. We are surrendering to God's maturation process. You understand the difference? You don't come to church going, man, i got to be a better whatever. No, you come to church and you go, i got to hold on to Jesus. And as you're holding on to Jesus, you realize you're becoming a better whatever. Because the Holy Spirit knows what you need to grow in more than you do. Peter's about to lay out a spiritual growth process that has steps. Did you happen to count how many steps? Seven. The number of perfection in the Bible. Peter says, before you become truly mature in Christ, you have to go through seven different phases or growth phases. You begin the transformation as you surrender to Jesus. It's all based on your faith to begin with. If you don't have faith in Jesus, you don't grow in any of these things, right? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit to grow. And every person who surrendered to Jesus from the moment of the early first century until today has gone through these exact seven processes. Everybody. The Holy Spirit does it with everybody. Simon says, look, the first change you will notice is virtue. As soon as you come up out of the water, as soon as you surrender your life to Christ, you're going to suddenly develop and notice that you have virtue. Well, we don't know what virtue means. Okay. That's cool. Virtue is a human disposition to that which is good and moral. Okay, somebody who has virtue may not be doing what's good and moral. Hopefully they will eventually, but their heart is turned that direction. Peter says the very first thing that happens when you become a new believer is for some reason external to you that you don't understand, your heart begins to move towards things that are moral. Your heart begins to move towards things that are good. The things that you have rejected for years, suddenly you're looking at going, huh, That may not be so bad after all. You may not be mature enough yet to act on that. You still may be doing what you did before, but at least there's a part of you now going, 
I have kind of a desire to be a more moral person. In fact, at this stage, I talk about it all the time. You're like that pregnant woman, which I might as well tell you. My daughter-in-law is going to have a grandbaby. Exactly. That's crazy, right? We're all excited about it. She's told us all about it, right? I went through the names I want to be called as grandfather, and uh, I want to be either faux pas, which they didn't like, or I want to be Jiffy Pop. (laughs) So I'm working on those, all right? But here's the deal. She is pregnant. She knows it. She feels it. She knows there's new life in her. If she was to walk into this room, we wouldn't see it. There'd be no evidence of it. And that's the way new believers are. I know I've changed. I know something in me has happened. All of a sudden, I have this desire to do good and moral things, and everybody's going, you're the same person you were last week at the bar. You look the same. Right, because I haven't grown yet, but I know I'm different. I know there's new life in me. Just wait and watch. Okay, we're going to wait and watch. And that's a problem with many new believers. They're so excited. They know there's new life in them, but nobody believes them because there hasn't been time to grow. You're pregnant with potential. You know something's changed. You know the name for it. You've become virtuous. You've been spiritually reborn. The Holy Spirit has made you virtuous. Because God is in you, you begin to pursue what God wants you to pursue. How does virtue manifest in your conversations? Well, when you talk to a new believer, they always say something like this. You know, once I gave my life to Christ, I just didn't enjoy doing those things anymore. It wasn't that I decided not to or I had to have all this willpower. I just suddenly thought, "Why? I don't want to do that. I'm becoming virtuous. It happens to everybody. It's one of the signs that show that you're becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. You, you surrender your life. You may not have changed it all on the outside, but on the inside, you just don't want to do the things you did before. If you remember, we went through a pattern in a series a while ago about desire temptation, choice, sin. Virtue is where God begins to change your desire. He doesn't have to give you more willpower to stop your sin. He just makes you a person that doesn't want to do that anymore. The second transformative thing, he says, that after you develop this virtue, you're going to begin to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with knowledge. Now, this is important because Peter's going to start challenging those who bring in false knowledge. But here's the deal. He's not talking about calculus or nuclear physics. He's talking about the knowledge of God. And he's not talking about the knowledge of God that comes from surrendering to Christ. He's not talking about your salvation knowledge. He's talking about your experience with Christ, knowing him personally, the relationship that you develop. After you begin to change in your heart and develop this virtue, the next thing that happens is you begin to fall in love with Jesus. You started out trying to learn about him, thinking that if you gained enough knowledge, you'd find salvation. But what happens is you fall in love with Jesus. You begin a relationship. In other words, we begin to have a relationship with him, and we try to gain information because we want to know more about the person we love. The Holy Spirit reveals to us more and more of him. As we hold on tighter, as we look more to Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts to show us things as we read the Bible, reveal things to us as we pray hear things through other believers and other people, and all of a sudden we begin to realize we're in a relationship. Now, we may not have changed anything in our life yet. Okay? We, we, we're just learning about Jesus. I don't even know half the stuff that I'm doing is wrong yet. I'm just learning. Our virtue continues to grow. We develop a love for him. Those around us begin to notice something. Wait a minute. You're starting to show. There's something about you that's different. I can see it in your eyes. I I can tell. Something in you is different. I don't know what it is, but it's different. I don't know if I like it or not, but it's different. I can hear it in your voice. Something significant and it's changed in you. You're not living for yourself anymore. You're not doing the things you used to do. The third thing that happens, Peter tells us, is we begin to gain self-control. Your virtue continues to grow. Your knowledge continues to grow. And then inside of you, something begins to happen. You develop self-control. 
Not that you're controlling yourself because you never could. That's how you ended up in the canyon, right? What happens is the Holy Spirit begins to control you. The Holy Spirit begins to enforce God's control on your life as you surrender. That's what surrender means. Not me, Lord, you. So what happens as we grow is all of a sudden we start having self-control we didn't even know we had. People offer us something that we would have done without even thinking about it, and all of a sudden something inside of us says, no. And we're like, wait a minute, where'd that come from? And your friends are looking at you like, what's wrong with you? Well, I'm just not the person I used to be. No, I don't want to do that. I have self-control now. Not perfect, not every time, not once and forever. Over time, I'm growing in self-control, just like I'm growing in knowledge and just like I'm growing in virtue. When you've spent your whole life out of control and suddenly you have this sense of control, you're experiencing a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And my mouse doesn't want to click. Hang on. So after that, the next phase we get into is, Peter says, steadfastness. We develop steadfastness. Steadfastness means unwavering resolve. A perseverance that transcends your circumstances. An awareness that something bigger is happening in your life than you. You develop a trust in God and you become expectant over time that he's going to take care of things. So you've had this this faith at the beginning and then you had virtue and then you have knowledge and and, and now all of a sudden you have self-control and now you're beginning to realize that you can persevere in this state. You have steadfastness, Peter says. Not something you decide or choose, it just happens. Things that used to freak you out are now less concerning than they used to be. Because deep down, something in you tells you God's got this, and it's going to be okay. So we're continuing to grow. The fifth thing Peter says is you start to develop godliness. Now, godliness does not mean that we're God. And the godliness here is with a little g on that reason. It means that we've developed a respect for God that impacts the way we live. Godliness does not mean we're God. We we have an awareness that God is doing things around us and through us that we're part of a bigger picture. And we want to start to align our lives with that reality. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Paul compares godliness to running a race, training, knowing, desiring moral things, growing in self-control, having steadfast focus. You're pursuing godly things because you love God so much. And you want to live more and more like him. Peter uses this word to speak for us to be continually aware of God's presence in our life. There's a point in our spiritual walk where we suddenly realize like, wow, you're really here. Like everywhere. Like wherever I go, you're, you're here. And then there's a bigger part where we go, wow, you've always been here. And then we run that reel through our head of the things we've done that Jesus stood by and watched us do. We're like, wow, if we position ourselves, God will allow us to become godly. Then he says the sixth thing you'll start to notice is brotherly affection. Interesting that the word for Greek for brotherly affection is Philadelphia. Brotherly love. In a moment, Peter's going to use a different word of love, agape love, to talk about the love we have with God. But regardless, as we grow in Christ, as we grow in virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness, and as we grow in godliness, there's a moment where all of a sudden we look around and we go, wow, I can't explain it, but I love you. There's like a bromance going on. I love you and I don't know why. You're weird. You're messed up. But for some reason, deep inside of me, I, I really care about you. And not in a I want to marry you kind of way, in a Philadelphia kind of way. It's not erotic, it's Philadelphia, it's brotherly love. I want the best for you. I want each of us to help each other present ourselves more like Christ. 
Hmm. As we grow in Christ, we, we grow this desire to be around other believers. And to not just be around them, but to do life with them. We all have faults. We're all messed up. But boy, you sure are lovable. I don't know why. So, sometimes what happens is we begin to change. We begin to notice. We begin to move. We understand that our bond for Jesus overcomes anything that separates us. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to accept one another, how to forgive one another, how to be patient with one another, how to serve one another, how to share one another's burdens, how to go through life holding people up when they're too tired to keep going. As we develop brotherly love, the Holy Spirit teaches us how to serve, how to forgive, how to challenge it's an incredible experience that occurs when the Holy Spirit connects people through Christ. People we've never met, but it feels like we've known them forever. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but you go across the world, across the country, or across the city, you've never met the person before, but within five minutes it feels like they're your best friend because you both know Jesus. It's incredible. And as we approach the final phase of this spiritual growth process, we may have spent years thus far Growing in virtue as we desire good and moral things. Growing in knowledge as we engage more and more with Jesus, not with just our head, but with our hearts. Growing in self-control, no longer chasing the things that used to entice us. We, we've likely been surprised when we've been steadfast in difficult times and had a strength we didn't even know we had. Growing godliness is our desires to be like him, to realize he's in our life. We want more of him, and that love of God can't help but overflow to the people of God. We're a bunch of odd people, but we love each other. And that's the beauty of the church that Jesus built. We're all living stones. We're all different shapes, sizes, positions, but he fits us all together into a beautiful church. But the final transformation in our spiritual growth is one that comes at us from nowhere. Final step, this comes straight from the throne of God. It didn't come from earth. It doesn't come from any person you know. And nobody has it. Nobody owns it. Nobody can make it. It comes straight from God. It's supernatural, and it's something that you could never on your best day come close to manifesting. Peter tells us that all these things are developing us, but one thing tells us when we are really, really maturing in Christ. Seventh thing that we begin to manifest is Jesus himself. He's going to become so powerfully present in our lives that we can't contain him. Like an alien that comes out of our chest, straight from our heart, the Holy Spirit's going to flow out of us to other people. And we're just going to blast people with his love. The Greek word that Peter uses for this love is agape love. It's the greatest expression of love in the Greek. It is the love of God from the throne of God being poured out to God's people through God's people. It's straight from heaven. The ultimate goal of believers in Jesus Christ as we get to the more mature stage of development, there is a love of God that is not ours that comes straight from his heart, pours through us, and floods other people with love. And that's when we begin to love everybody. We love our enemies. We love the poor. We love the homeless. We love people that hate us. We love everybody. We just can't help it. We just love them. They're deceived by Satan, and we recognize they're fallen, but we still love them. We don't want to see ill happen to anybody. It's a really high part of spiritual growth. It's rare, actually, in the church. It's hard. Agape defines God's immeasurable, incomparable love for humans. It's ongoing, outgoing, self-sacrificing, always on the lookout for lost and fallen people. God gives this love without condition to every person. Nobody deserves it, everybody gets it. 
Love is not only the last and greatest Christian virtue, it's also the glue that holds the rest of us together. The quality without which none of us would be who we are. Colossians 3, verse 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Picture again the living church that we've been talking about. Jesus is the cornerstone. The 12 apostles guarded and protected the truth, which is the foundation. Each of us are living stones bound together in brotherly love. Put together by the Holy Spirit, building God's church, a place where God can dwell, a place where God can show himself to the world. A place where we collectively reveal God's agape love to the world. Welcoming every human to take their place in the wall. Love is the glue that keeps it all together. When you see God's love poured out on people who are non-believers, you know you're seeing the expression of a believer who's mature in their faith. It's relatively rare to see somebody who absolutely loves every person they see. And love them unconditionally with the love of Jesus. It's rare. It's an incredible gift. But God says that's the goal for all of us. We all should be there. If we've been following Jesus for a long time, that should be who we are. And if we're not that person, something has stagnated our growth. So Peter tells us, look, there's seven transformational challenges, each one leading to the next, but we're growing in all of them all the time. This is the blueprint of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. Now, did you notice that the process starts with faith and ends with love? Don't miss that powerful thing. Something you could meditate on. The end goal of every believer, why were you rescued? To know God. What does that mean? To do my very best to allow the Holy Spirit free access in my life to make me more like Jesus. To love my friends, my enemies, every person I lay eyes on, to love them, truly love them, unconditionally, fully, completely, and you say, I can't do that. You're right, you can't. But God can through you. And it's not your love you're pouring out, it's his. He loves everyone. Peter's point is clear. Spiritual growth is not a matter of Christians can treat lightly. It's something you have to strive for. Make every effort. Again, you don't do these things, you get out of the way and let God do them. If at any point along the way you get stagnated, you get stuck... You refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest in your life. You'll stop to grow. That sin that you don't agree with. Those scriptures that you've rewritten in your mind, the control you never really had but won't let go of. That person you refuse to forgive. God's word that never quite gets to your heart because you don't spend time abiding in the word. The time you spend chasing other gods. We can have hundreds of ways to stagnate our spiritual growth. But here's the thing. Once you understand this growth process, you can almost look at somebody and know where they are in the process. That's why it's so powerful. You can look at yourself and know where you are in the process. Think about where you are in these steps. Think about whether you actually fit into the spiritual clothes you're trying to wear, right? We all come to church, we dress up, we act like we're stage seven believers, when truthfully we're struggling in stage two, we just don't want anybody to know it. We go through these steps, we continue to grow, we continue to do these things, and then at some point you reach this place where you just love everybody and you don't know how or why. These stages of spiritual growth are interesting, but you may be asking yourself, okay, this is Peter's last letter. Why is he writing this? Why is this important at all? People are going to die soon. Gnostics are going to come in and teach falsehood. You're going to die. You're on death row, Peter. Why is spirituality 101 important to you? Well, I think for three reasons. 
First, every believer needs to have a very clear understanding of where they are and where they're going. Too many people in the church are wearing spiritual clothes that don't fit them. They're trying to... They come to church, they're babies in the faith, and they're trying to convince you that they're mature believers. And here's the sad part. Nobody tells them that they're not wearing the right spiritual clothes because everybody else is wearing the same thing. Second, Peter knows that Gnostics are going to try to deceive believers. And here's what happens in this growth process. You accept Christ, you become aware that there's a godly way to live, and you become more aware that you're not doing it. You see, because you have virtue now, and you have knowledge now, but you don't have self-control yet. So you're at that point in your life where you're going, okay, I think something's different, but everybody, all my friends say I've not changed, and I just keep doing the things I know I'm not supposed to do, so maybe it didn't take. Maybe I'm not really saved. Instead of thinking, no, I'm saved, I have the Holy Spirit in me, the fact that I'm concerned about it tells me I have the Holy Spirit in me because I was never worried about it before. But the reality is, I'm just new in the faith. I haven't got to the other lessons yet. See, Peter's like, you got to know where you are because the Gnostics are going to come in and tell you that it never took. You have to have absolute confidence in your salvation or false teachers will come and carry you away. So this stepwise fashion allows you to say, well, no, I don't love people the way other believers do. I don't have the godliness they have. I don't have some of the steadfastness they have, but, but I am over here in virtue. And that's where God has me right now. And I'm as saved as they are. I've received the same faith they have. I just have a lot more growing to do. But the main reason I think Peter is about to teach his readers about these steps is that as soon as you know the steps, as soon as you know what a normal believer does and every believer grows through, you'll recognize a false believer quicker. That's why he's doing it. See, the Gnostics are coming. And he's going to tell us, look, you're going to see a false believer by the way they live. Not necessarily everything they teach, but by the way they live. So if you see somebody over here spouting this love of everybody, but over here they have no self-control, they have no uh, knowledge, they have, they have no godliness, that's your first sign that something's horribly wrong. They, they tried to jump ahead and present themselves in a place they're not to be. He continues, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sin. Don't miss the implication here. Peter implies here that every believer possesses all seven of these attributes. The moment you accept Christ, some of these attributes are placed in you, all seven. You will have a little bit more love for other people. You'll have a little bit more love for your church. You'll have a little bit more godliness. You'll have a little bit more of everything than you had before. And, and what he's telling you is, look, these are all yours, but they're going to develop and grow in a certain pattern. So you're going to see virtue start to rise up. You'll still have some love for other people, but the first step the Spirit takes you through is virtue. And then knowledge. And, and what you're going to see is from left to right, left to right, you're going to grow in each of these areas. So as you're growing in godliness, your virtue should be way higher, right? Because you've been growing in virtue now longer. And the growth of a spiritual believer is you grow in these things to maturity. And you never stop growing. You already possess them. The seeds are there. The Holy Spirit's going to grow you. It's a self-test. He says, look, if these qualities are yours, in other words, look at this list, do you have these qualities? And, he says, are increasing. Interesting. If we look at our own life with Christ, we should see things growing. But Peter says, you got to know. You have to know. What I do every year on my birthday is I take this passage, among other things I do that day, and I write down each of these, and I give myself a score on 1 to 10 in each one, right? How am I doing in virtue? How am I doing in godliness? 
And I'll put down, you know, 3.6, 5.8, whatever. A year from now, I'll come back and do it again. Am I growing in Christ? Am I becoming a better believer? God, show me where I am in this part of my spiritual walk. And at the end of this, I'll share with you an area where I'm stagnated. But it helps you sort of understand. You should be growing, he says. Peter says, look, you should have these and they should be growing in you. Honestly, that's been why it's hard to grow a remnant. Now, let's be really honest. We're a church that's deeply focused on reaching the less fortunate. Doing so requires a pretty mature faith for people. There are a lot of seventh level believers before you start loving everybody. There are believers who have an unconditional love for everybody, but that's graduate level stuff. Someone who's new in their faith, just trying to figure out virtue, you can't expect them to have seventh level faith. It's not possible. For, for new believers, they don't understand because it's just not where they are. Now, if you've been believers for years, if you've been walking in and out of church for 20 years and say you've surrendered your life to Christ, you should have a love for everybody by now. If not, something stagnated. But that new believer hasn't learned that yet. See, and so what happens is, as a church, we've got to meet everybody where they are. Some people here are in kindergarten, spiritually. It's okay. It's better than the alternative. But you have to grow. And God is the one growing you. And we as a church have to help you no matter where you are in your spiritual growth. If you're stuck, we have to help you get unstuck. That's what the church is about. It's a training ground for discipleship, for spiritual growth. It's not about just coming to Jesus, surrendering your life, and saying, oh, I'm saved. The church, Jesus said, go make disciples. Train them in the way they should go. That's what Peter's talking about. We're going to be making changes at Remnant that are going to align better with this growth process, and I'll talk about that soon, or at the partner meeting, whichever comes first. Uh, the challenge of growing a church is you've got to meet everybody where they are. And, and so that's kind of what we learned. Years ago, I participated in a nationwide survey of believers. And there were many questions, but there were questions related to spirituality, where you are in a mature state, okay? And this was sent out, I think, to over 500,000 believers. And people answered questions that revealed where they think they are spiritually. Now, it's interesting that most pastors place themselves two to three to four levels below where their congregation placed themselves. It was universal throughout the study. And they looked at any individual church. The pastor rated himself here. The congregation was about up here somewhere. The researchers noted that pastors were far more confident in their salvation and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives but the more they studied the word, the more they knew they didn't measure up. And the more they knew about God and the perfection and the incredibleness of Jesus, the more they realized they're nowhere close. The more you realize how far you have to go and how far we all are from really being level seven believers who love everybody unconditionally. We're, we're far from that. Aside from seeing where we are, Peter is giving us to see the Gnostic tool. The progression here, somebody who claims to have godliness but doesn't have self-control is an imposter. It's that simple. Whenever I'm faced with a situation in a, our church, someone's a threat to the church, I go back to this list and ask God to show me if this is a misguided believer who needs to be educated or an imposter wolf who needs to be let out the door. Peter touches for the first time on why in his own reader situation this is so important. False teachers are coming. If you don't know the spiritual growth process and you don't know that in order to get over here and claim you have this, you have to be showing these things in your life. And if you're not, that's not the Holy Spirit doing this. Peter's going to teach much more about how to recognize a false teacher based on their life than to recognize them based on what they actually teach. He goes so far, he said, these people are nearsighted and blind. Well, that's interesting. How can you be blind and then be nearsighted? Well, the Greek participle 
Maapazan could be translated because of shutting one's eyes. You're not really blind, you're shutting your eyes to be blind. Forgotten all that he's been cleansed from his past sins. These fake Christians are claiming to be saved, but they're not. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. So Peter's wrapping up here, and he says, look, because my death is coming, because the Gnostics are coming, you have to make every effort to supplement your faith and be more diligent. You've got to confirm your call. What does that mean? Let me translate it for you. The Gnostics are coming, and you better know if you have the Holy Spirit or not, period. It's okay to be in an early step of faith. Everybody goes through the faith steps, but make absolutely sure you're on the path and the Holy Spirit's in you. Confirm in your own mind your election to the family of God. Know right now and forever that you belong to him. Grab your lifeline because you're going to need it. But you make absolutely sure you know you're in this process, whatever step you're on. Now, God is sure of his elect, but we might not always be. Assurance is one's confidence that he possesses eternal salvation. In other words, the spiritual person who sees these things growing in their life knows the Holy Spirit is in them no matter how much growth they've seen because it doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. Peter says, make sure you know you're saved. And then he says, and you'll never fail. Does that mean you'll never sin? No. Too much scripture says that's not true. Too much of a life says that's not true. What he's saying is, look, if you focus on knowing you're saved, you'll never have to worry about it again the rest of your life. You'll never fail at knowing you're a believer of Christ. You'll never fail at knowing the salvation is yours. You cannot fail to know who you are in Christ. And he says, for this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord. Peter's saying, look, here, here's what he's saying. Dude, okay, he probably didn't say dude. But it is a Peter kind of word. I think Peter would have used that word if he had it. So he said, look, you spend your life focusing on letting the Holy Spirit grow you in these seven areas. Don't stop him. Don't impede him. Abide, surrender. Let him let you grow. And you'll not just sneak into heaven. You'll be able to go, boldly go home with confidence. Not just in yourself, but in what God has done through you. So Peter says, the Gnostics are coming. You better know without a doubt, and you better know without a doubt that you are saved and the Holy Spirit's in you. So at the risk of being too transparent, let me close with this. One area in my life where I'm struggling is brotherly love. When I ask God to rate me on these seven things, brotherly love for me is a struggle pretty bad for your pastor, right? <laughs> you think I'd have that one nailed. Is that where I'm at? Honestly, just being really raw. I've been deeply hurt by brothers and sisters in Christ who are very close to me. I have a hard time trusting anybody again. Maybe you know what that's like, to be burned by people who claim to be believers and to realize the pain that that causes and how hard it is to trust other people. I find myself wanting to trust, but out of fear, I guard my heart. <laughs> Holy Spirit's working me through it. It's been a 10-year journey with four years of very intense training. It's been very slow. I want to trust everyone and love everybody the way God wants me to, but I'm afraid. People closest to me deeply wounded me. I've forgiven them, but I haven't learned how to trust yet. I have not yet fully learned how to love people the way I used to. I know it's crazy, but I'm being honest. It'll get better with time and new experiences will replace old ones, but I have a long way to go in this area. Now, since I know where I am, I know that I can't fully love everybody in the world the way God wants me to do until I solve this. It's stagnating me. I'm stuck in six. Nothing else is going to grow past six if I don't get through this. Right? So whatever love I had for the world, for everybody, at the moment I got stuck in six, that's not going to grow anymore until I get this part down. 
And while I'm here, I'm still growing in virtue and knowledge and self-control and all that stuff. But the pattern of my life right now is God's working with me on brotherly love. So if I can spill my guts, your pastor who struggles with brotherly love is begging you in love to not only know you're saved, but know where you really are in the process. See, the Gnostics are coming. They're already here. Know where you are in the growth process. Make absolutely sure that your spiritual clothes fit. Be comfortable where you are in Christ, wherever the Holy Spirit has you. Just be thankful you're in Christ. And be on guard for those who claim maturity and then fake it. Let's pray. God, I thank you that your word is always so clear and powerful. I thank you that you didn't just leave us here to try to figure it out on our own. You give us very specific direction on how to live our lives, step by step. And not only do you promise us that we'll be like Jesus, you tell us that you're the one that's going to do the work. That if we can just get out of our own way, if we can just surrender to you, if we can just quit trying to be our own God and quit making up our own Bible and surrender to your truth, you will transform us into people we can't imagine being. And that you've kept us here so that we can become those people. Because there's a world that needs to see you. There's a world that needs to see your love. And the only way they're going to see your love is if it comes through us. So help us, God, to be better reflections of you to the world. Allow us to surrender and get out of the way so you can become the Lord of our lives. So you can become power, the love, the joy that people see in us, and they know it's not of us, and they're drawn to you. Your word says when Christ is lifted up, all men are drawn. Help us, God, to lift you up. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.